Hi, welcome to our Centro Church online service. We're so glad that you could join us today, whether it's the first time you've watched or whether you're re-watching because you enjoyed the message. Hey, if this is your first time joining us today, there's a little QR code that's coming up on your screen right now. If you could scan that one, there's a new to Centro section or link that you can click and you can fill out your information and one of our team will get in touch with you. There's also a number of other links that you can click to explore as well. We know that you'll be so blessed by our message today and you'll see us again at the end of the service. So why don't we check out today's message? Wowee. Baby dedications make you feel like church is a family, hey? It just, it just hits that part of you. I don't think I've ever seen a spontaneous one before. I've seen a spontaneous baptism, but never a baby dedication. Well, good. That shows we're growing. Yeah, thanks, Tash. Thank you, Tash agrees. Anyone else? Do I hear yeah. that? Yeah, I yeah. feel like an auctioneer. We are going to continue with our series called The Red Letters. Now, I've got to say, I've got to say that last week, morning and night, we had two outstanding sermons from two young guys, you know, really, really plucked out some truth and, and dropped it into our laps. It was great. Even if one of them was my son. I can say it. So the red letters, why are we calling this series the red letters? Because the, if you've got a Bible with you this morning, if you've got a Bible with you this morning, I'd be very surprised. So we have phones now that have Bibles on them. But if you, if you have a Bible, it may have the words of Jesus written in red so that we know that's what Jesus said and that distinguishes it from the rest of the text. When, when I got saved, like 40 odd years ago, I had a good news Bible, as everybody did in those days, because it was the Jesus people revolution, and I had, was, all the letters were black. And then Vicky Diefenbach, who's sitting down the back doing, doing words for us this morning, gave me a good news Bible with a beige vinyl cover, which matched my beige Datsun 180B. And lo and behold, I opened it up and there were the words of Jesus in red. I thought, that is amazing, this new innovation. Unbeknown to me, the first red letter edition of the Bible was in 1899. So it wasn't sort of a new thing. It had been around for 80 years, but I didn't have a clue. So this morning, we're going we're gonna to take a text from the Bible that was actually the words that Jesus said. And, uh, and we'll have a look at what comes from that. We're going to talk about faith this morning, okay? When we talk about faith and we talk about faith from the Word of God, something happens. Something actually happens because the, the, the words in the Scriptures, they are spirit and life. They're not just words on a page. They leave a deposit. They travel to you and do something, yeah? Why well, don't agree with me on that? Yeah. Okay, so we're going, to, we're going to look at the story this morning in the book of Matthew, chapter 8, Starting at verse 5, it's about a Roman centurion. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, verse 5, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell this one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. It, must, it would take a lot to amaze Jesus, but he was amazed. And he said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the West and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You don't want to be there. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. So here we have Matthew's gospel. Something happens, a miraculous event happens. But what Matthew is trying to do, Matthew is a Jew, he's a Hebrew, and he's writing specifically to Hebrews, and he's trying to connect with their history and their view of God. And so he actually is paralleling a passage with Moses. See, Moses goes up 
if you know the story, into Mount Sinai. He has an encounter with God. He comes back and he brings 10 commandments to the Jewish people. Well, Jesus comes down from the mountain, the Sermon on the Mount, which was an epic sermon that went for a long time. And he comes down from the mountain and he performs 10 miraculous acts. He's saying that this is a new day. But Matthew is trying to link that to what Moses did so that the Jews will say, hey, this guy could be the Messiah. So the centurion is the one that we've got to look at here. He, he actually has this understanding, and Jesus says he's amazed by it. He has this understanding of how healing works, how faith works, how authority works. He comes, and he, he, he comes to Jesus with this understanding of healing and authority, but more importantly, he understands covenant. Covenant is what makes authority happen. And so he understands this. And by in doing that, he understands something about the nature of God, that God is a healing God. And so he just says, no, you can just say the word and it'll happen. And that is great faith. And he should be commended for it. See, we live in a society where faith is sort of swimming upstream, isn't it? It's not a society that is conducive to faith. We live in a secular world and the cultural framework that we have works against believing in God. It undermines faith. It undermines particularly supernatural belief. And because of that, Western civilization is now more built around doubt and questioning. It's sort of, you know, hard to have faith just naturally. The theologian Peter Berger said that Western culture is now set up to make you doubt. In 1500 AD in the West, it was almost impossible to not believe in God. But now it's almost impossible not to be confronted and racked by doubt. Western culture thinks that we've, we've come a long way from dead messiahs rising on the third day, miracles and that sort of thing. We now have science and Wikipedia, so we know better. But it's not like that. So having faith in these times is swimming upstream, yeah? yeah? It's going against the flow of the times. Let's have a look at some theology of faith. Let's see how that, that all works. And for this, we go to a verse where often the Bible doesn't give a definition, but in this case, it does. And so we go to Hebrews 11, chapter 1. Now, I want to show you something here. I want to show you the difference between two streams of translating this verse. Okay, so bear with me, and we'll, we'll work through it. A little bit of Bible nerding here, so the Bible nerds will love this. Don't switch off. So this verse, Hebrews 11.1, 1, there it is in front of you. It says, faith is the assurance, the confidence of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So the words there are, faith is the upostasis. That's the Greek. It sounds vaguely pharmaceutical, doesn't it? I'll have a tube of upostasis, please. The applicator. <laughs> Faith is the upostasis of things hoped for, the elenkos of things not seen. And in versions such as the New International, the English Standard Version, the New American Standard, it is translated that way, the assurance. Faith is the assurance slash confidence of things hoped for, the conviction of, not, of things not seen. But and other translations, such as the King James Version, the, the, uh, the CEV, the National, New American Standard 2020, which is the latest one, and the New Living, translate this in another way. So we got that one, yep. So it says, faith is the substance, the reality of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, according to these translations, faith is not a mental state. The first translations we looked at, it's like you have to get faith in your mind to do something. But the second one, sort of, it shows faith as an experience on which action is based. You get in touch with the substance, some kind of reality of the thing that you are hoping for. We have to change from the idea of hope so to be so. The assurance and the confidence is different to the substance. So, are those sets of verses different? They're totally different, but you shouldn't worry about that. 
when you're trying to translate one language into another, there's rarely a precise equivalent from the Greek to the English. English words that we have in our translation are correct, but maybe they lack the emphasis and potency of the Greeks. I mean, you know, it's like the two different nationalities. The Greeks, they, they love their food, they're passionate, they wave their hands around. You know, when, when their team scores in football, they'll go on a riot. The English, hurrah. <laughs> so sometimes when you're translating the Greek to the English, you've got to add a bit of emphasis. And there is one translation that does that, the Amplified. So we will let the Amplified version have the last word. Hebrews 11.1 in the Amplified says this. Now, faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of things we hope for, being the proof of the things we do not see and the conviction of their reality, faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. That is, is a much more emphatic way of seeing faith, isn't it? Faith is the confirmation, the title deed, it's the assurance it's, we know God is going to do this because he's done it before and we know him and we know his nature and we know what he's like and we know what his will is. We know it's his intent to heal us. It's his intent to save us. It's his intent that we should have lives full of the Holy Spirit working, yeah? So this morning we're going to look at four things, four things that will help us to understand faith and grow in faith. The four things are, I'll come up there in a minute. First one, the example of Abraham. We'll look at the father of faith. Hearing, what has hearing got to do with faith? The third thing is every whisper matters and then those are all teachy things and then we get to number four which is the Pentecostal advantage. Are there any Presbyterians in the building? You might want to know where the exits are. So let's look at the example of Abraham, Romans 4. This, this, is, this is a classic passage on faith. So let's read it together and let's take it in. Don't just make it as a, some throwaway verses. Verse 17, as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you in the presence of him who, be, who he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. Let that sink in. So Abraham... At verse 18, in hope, against hope, he believed so that he might become a father of many nations. According to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Verse 19, without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, in the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promises of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. Abraham wasn't denying the reality of the circumstances that he and Sarah found themselves in. Like he's 100, she's at least 80. It's, you know, in the natural, it's not on the cards, is it, to have, have a child. But they don't, they don't brush off the facts, but they don't allow them to affect the way they live their lives. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver. He was strong and steadfast. He doesn't deny the things which are seen or perceived by the senses, but he denies their right to govern how he lives. You need to get that. And he is fully assured or persuaded that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. This is going totally against the grain of what the natural world has trained us to do. The natural world trains us to be governed by our senses and the circumstances that we're in. So living by faith has a close relationship with what God has spoken or is speaking. So let's look at the difference between that. Let's look at number two hearing. Even though the Bible is the word of God, spoken by God, if someone was to come along and destroy the Bible in all of its manifestations, written pages, 
voice recordings, digital versions, every format, if someone was to come and destroy that, the Word of God would still exist because it's alive and it's spirit and life. The Bible is what God has said. It tells us how He, God, thinks. But, and when, but when He speaks now, He tells us what He's thinking now. So if I go into a situation knowing what God is like, that will always help. And we can find that from the Bible. But if I go into a situation where God has just spoken to me personally, telling me what he's thinking now, that can change everything. So even if I was to listen to the theory, and I don't, that God doesn't speak, that I should just read the Bible because that's all the speaking he's going to do. If I read that, I find him speaking to everybody. Adam and Eve and Cain, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, even pagan kings like Abimelech and Pharaoh. That's in the first book. So God is speaking to them and he's speaking now. Do you believe that? Yeah, yeah good. That's a good response. If knowing the Bible and knowing what was written there were synonymous with knowing God, then the Pharisees would have been the good guys because they knew it all. They knew the scriptures, but when the living word of God stood in front of them, they didn't recognize him. God speaks. He is speaking. Heaven is very talkative, but how well do we listen? Let me give you a biblical context. In the New Testament, there are two Greek words that are, that are translated word of God. One is logos, which is the previously spoken word of God, what God has said in the past. That is recorded for us in the scriptures. It orientates us to God's nature and what, how he thinks and what he does. Rima is the word of God uttered by the living voice, the freshly spoken word of God, what God is saying now, what he said to you last night, what he's speaking to you right now about. That is the Rima. That being said, we come to a verse about hearing. And it's found in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. And it says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, the most common interpretation of this is that faith comes by hearing the word of God. But that's not what it says. It says something totally different. It says faith comes from hearing and hearing comes from the word of God. We listen to God's voice not to find something in addition to scripture, but we find something to clarify what's been written. If faith comes by hearing the word of God, then you can go to bed, plug in your Bible app, put your ear earphones in, bring up the new international version, press play, and Max McLean will read the NIV straight into your brain, and you'll wake up with the faith of Wigglesworth. <laughs> if it were true. But it isn't. It doesn't mean that. What it means is by Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It means when you read the Bible, what you do is you orientate your ears to what God, how God is and what he says. So you can discern when it's not him. What you do is you create a discerning palette for understanding the scriptures. So you can, like, I have had people come up to me and say, I believe that God has said this. And, it, and he couldn't have because it goes against what he's actually said in the scriptures. It, it contradicts it. So you know, you know that it goes against, you feel, no, that's not right, because you have a discerning palate from reading the word of God. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by exposure to his word, and you de develop that discernment. My capacity to hear God is enhanced by reading the scriptures. You don't learn the counterfeit, by studying the counterfeit, you study the authentic. You just become so exposed to the real that the counterfeit stands out. When I was 19 and a young bank officer, we did, we did a course on counterfeit notes. And I thought they were going to show us all the counterfeit notes and how, how people had you know, made mistakes and that sort of thing, but they didn't. They showed us the real notes. And by looking at the real notes, we would then recognize what was counterfeit. The same applies with the Word of God. We immerse ourselves in the Scriptures, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, and then we know when something comes to us, that oh, maybe that's not him, because we know what he's like, and we know how he thinks, and we know what he speaks. I need to have a relationship with the Scriptures that is regular 
and consistent and continuous if I want to hear from God. If you're going to discern evil, you don't immerse yourself in evil. You immerse yourself in him so you know when it's not like him. Yeah? yeah that's good. Number three, every whisper matters. Ephesians 4, 29 says this, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Every whisper matters. I have trouble with this verse. I have trouble getting it in my own life, particularly when I'm driving. You know, I might, I might be given to a little bit of criticism of other drivers, just a little bit. I might be given to providing some advice. But every time I speak a negative thing, it affects me, yeah? Every whisper matters. We've quoted some scriptures this morning, but I'd like to quote a prophet, a modern poet slash prophet, Michael Stipe, or Stipey to his friends. You know who he is? The lead singer of R.E.M. Get this line from the song, Losing My Religion. Every whisper of every waking hour, I'm choosing my confessions. That could almost be the Bible. You know, if you said that was in the Proverbs, we'd, we'd go, amen, yeah. But every, every minute, every whisper of every waking hour, choose what you say. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can construct with your tongue and you can pull down with your tongue, yeah? One of the best examples of this is found in the Old Testament, in the book of Job. If, I don't know if you're familiar with it. it probably there are a lot of you are. What it is, is this, there's this character, Job. He's rich. He's got lots of livestock. He's got sons and daughters who party a bit and he worries about them, so he offers sacrifices for him. He's got a wife who um, could be a nag, but we'll talk about that later on. Um, anyway, in, in the second chapter, through uh, like a, an encounter within the spirit realm, it's decided to take all of Job's possessions away. And so he loses all his possessions. His, his family die. His, his kids all get killed in, a, in an accident. He loses all his livestock and only has one servant left. And so he's, he's really feeling bad about this. And, and he makes a confession that actually gives us an idea as to where his heart is. He makes a confession. The thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. Now, you've got, to, you've got to say that if this was something, Job losing all of his possessions, was something he greatly feared, he would have spoken about it, yeah? So maybe he, he talked about that, but God doesn't, God doesn't hold that against him as sin. It's called, he calls him blameless. But Job had this little chink in his armor. He had a negative speech issue. And, and so what happens, another incident happens and Job is struck with sickness and he's sitting in a rubbish dump scraping boils with a piece of pot, pottery. Okay, not great. And his wife is standing beside him saying, why don't you just curse God and die? What a charming woman. <laughs> anyway, what Job does is that there's two chapters of that and then there's like 40 chapters of dense Hebrew poetry where his, his mates come and tell him why it's happened and none of them are right. And the book is constructed to make you think you know why it happens, but when you get to the end, you find out you don't know why it, ha why it happens because there's actually no reason why it happened. But anyway, Job changes his confession over the course of those 40 chapters. And at the end, he's speaking to God and he says this, and it's brilliant, and it should always be our confession. Whenever something goes wrong, whenever we pray for something and doesn't happen, whenever we lose a loved one, we should say, God, I know that with you, all things are possible and your purposes cannot be thwarted. That is a declaration that we should be making regularly, yeah? So what Job has done is, has changed his confession over this period of time and then God restores him. He has more children, more livestock. He, he's richer than he was earlier. The biggest miracle in all of that 
was how did he have more children with someone who said, curse God and die? I mean, that, you know, that begs the question, doesn't it, really? You know, you've got to think, holy moly. <laughs> so, every minute, every whisper of every waking hour, we're choosing our confession, right? We are choosing our confession, which brings me to number four, the Pentecostal advantage. You know, we're, we're a Pentecostal church. We are unashamedly Pentecostal. You know, people call us happy clappers. You know, I, I don't know that that fits. I mean, you know, we, we have the loud music. We have demonstrative praise and worship. We lift our hands. We have bright lights. We have the Fogmaster 5000 pumping out a heavenly mist. <laughs> you know, but none of that means that we're Pentecostal. It just means we like a good show, you know. What we believe happened on the day of Pentecost makes us Pentecostal. We fully believe, we fully believe that when we get saved, we get the Holy Spirit in us, he indwells us, he pushes us towards forming Jesus in us. That's what he does. That he, he develops the fruit of the Spirit in us over a period of years by process but we also believe in a second experience that happened on the day of Pentecost called the baptism in the Holy Spirit and what happened when the baptism of the Holy Spirit came when when the Holy Spirit came in power what happened what did they do they spoke in tongues now we have to we have to clarify we have to clarify between Speaking in tongues, it happens when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and becomes your prayer language, your heavenly language, and the gift of tongues, which God used to use, not so much these days, in services where someone would stand up and give a message in tongues and then someone would stand up and interpret. That is a totally different thing to speaking in tongues in your prayer language. I mean, this morning we had a prayer meeting here and like English was the second language, yeah. it really was. You know, there, there were all sorts of all sorts of languages going up, and all of them inspired by the by the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is a prayer language that bypasses my human mind. We have a Western cynicism that is, I would say, almost inherent when it comes to the supernatural, and sometimes bypassing your mind is a good thing. Now, a neurologist called Andrew Newberg has done empirical studies on the brain functioning um, among a variety of practitioners ranging from Catholic nuns engaging in centering prayer to Pentecostals praying in tongues. And his studies showed that the frontal lobe of the brain was very active in normal praying and singing. But while speaking in tongues, there was no activity in the frontal lobe. The brain was effectively bypassed. As Newberg discovered this, he sat down and he cried that it was possible to speak to God that didn't go through your mind, didn't get tainted by your thoughts or your experiences or what you believe about God or your church baggage. You speak in tongues, it is a direct passage to the Father, yes? Please don't be afraid of this. The Holy Spirit is in us to produce Christ's likeness and he is on us for power. Paul called it, praying in the spirit okay what does that have to do with faith well paul says it builds up our faith and that he spoke in tongues more than anyone so in jude verse 20 only one cha one chapter so jude verse 20 he says this but you beloved building yourselves up on your most holy faith praying in the holy spirit so pray just the mere praying in tongues speaking in tongues will increase your faith so because of our teaching tradition because of what we believe about heavenly language or prayer language we have an edge we have the pentecostal advantage we pray in tongues and we're built up in our faith yeah, yeah. don't tell the presbyterians at the end of the day if the band could join me on stage at the end of the day we will all make decisions and take actions 
today, tomorrow, this week, this month, based on what we know about God. You're here this morning based on what you know about God. You know that by coming to church, God will be active in your life, that the the fellowship of the saints will have an effect on you, it will help to form Christ in you, and so you come because you know that about God. That is faith. It takes faith to make a lifetime of doing that, to do it every week, week in, week out. And when the daily, weekly, monthly decisions and actions all add up, the trajectory of your life is a trajectory of faith. That when, you're, when you've been serving Jesus for 30 or 40 years and you've been making decisions based on, him, on what you know about God, it adds up. The cumulative effect is faith. All the times you've chosen to gather with the saints, to turn up at the at church, to give, to serve, to invite, are choices based on the substance of faith. But sometimes there will be events, there will be disappointments, there will be losses, and intentionally or unintentionally can cause us to back off. And in the same way as a life of faith is built on the sum of moments, then that can also be eroded by a sum of moments, and that's a tragedy. And perhaps it might benefit you to have someone just gently pray with you this morning and maybe reset the arc of your life. Maybe you've come to church this morning for reasons you don't know, and For some reason, it might be something that happened during the dedication. It might be something that happened during the singing. It might be something that that I've said that has affected you in some way. It's, it's, your ears pricked up. You thought, I wonder about that. Then what is required is an act of faith, that we respond to that. So I'm going to create some space at the front of the church here this morning. I want to ask if anything that's happened during the course of this morning has got your attention. And maybe you just want someone to gently pray with you, take you by the hand, and just just pray over you into your situation. Maybe you need to get the sum of moments in your life that give you faith back on track. So, we're going to stand. We're going to sing. And as we sing, just make yourself available out the front. Our prayer team will come and they'll pray with you and agree with you and and give you some guidance in, in these matters. I'm just going to pray for you now. Father God, we thank you that you are at work in our lives. Lord, that you are constantly giving us moments that build our faith and our actions, Lord God, that we, that we undertake, Lord God, build faith in, in you. Father, we thank you that you are a faithful God, that your loyalty to the covenant is unending and that you always work out for good those things which don't add up to us, that you are active in our situation down through history, through our lives and into our moment right now, working things out for good. We know you never fail at that. And everyone said, amen. Amen. We're so glad that you could join us for our Centro Church online service. If you did want to connect with us, don't forget to scan the QR code and fill out your details. Also, if there was something in the message that stood out to you and you'd like to say yes to Jesus, then scan that QR code, click the Say Yes to Jesus link, and one of our pastoral team will get in contact with you this week. We hope and pray that you'll join us at one of our live services next week, either at 5 Pring Street, Ipswich at 9am or 5pm, or at our Collingwood Park location at Woodlink State School at 10am. Blessings from our senior pastors, Pastor Tim and Pastor Catherine Spark, and all of the team here at Centro. Have a blessed day.